top secret. The smoke rising from the Automedon's chimney was just ahead of us, and we didn't even have to change course. In a couple of hours we were so close that if we had stayed a little longer we would have had to maneuver urgently to avoid a collision. If they get on the air now, I thought, it will be suicide. But a few seconds after our warning shot, the airwaves exploded with a cry for help. It was valiant. It was futile. It really was suicide. Hey! And shells flew into the hull of an old steamer with a long antique pipe. We'd seen ships before after being shelled by our guns. But the Automedon looked the worst of all. Climbing aboard, the first thing I experienced was amazement, even perhaps bewilderment at the extent of the destruction wrought by our shells. The Automedon was rocking violently, and in the rhythm of the rocking there were broken cables and hoses, splinters of wood and metal moving along the deck. From all sides came the hissing sound of steam escaping from broken pipes. The smoky stack had been blown through and was more like a colander. The pile drivers had been mangled by splinters, and where the radio room had once been, a pile of wooden debris now smoked lazily. One of the members of the boarding party looked around at the devastation and whistled in shock. Part of the living deck was missing, a hole with jagged, jagged edges like a bayoneted tin can, the size of a barn gate, torn and gutted sandbags, dropped from machine gun emplacements by the blast wave, were lying everywhere. The contents covered shapeless piles of all kinds of debris and scraps. But the worst was ahead of me. After showing marvels of dexterity and managing to climb up the half-destroyed gangway to the bridge, jumping over the holes left in place of steps, trying not to cut myself on the razor-sharp steel plates and avoiding the traps of hanging electrical wires. I saw the dead. All the officers of the Automedon were dead. They had died together and at once, and the cause of their deaths had been a direct hit by a shell in the very centre of the bridge. We set to work and were surprised to find that this ancient vessel was carrying fifteen sacks of secret mail, including a centre of code tables, naval orders, artillery instructions, and so-called naval intelligence reports. What, I wondered, were the British thinking, I wondered, trusting such a valuable cargo to a slow-moving, rusty paddle boat? A modern warship would have been more suitable. This I could not understand. But after spending an hour with axe in hand trying to open the massive safe of the automedon and finding nothing but a few shillings in cash, I found the most valuable booty. It was in the navigator's cabin, a metre from the bodies of the dead officers, and it was only then that I realised the tragic irony of the situation. All six had served their cause faithfully, but it was the universality of their sacrifice that had done irreparable damage to the object for which it had been made. All those entrusted with top-secret documents of which the crew knew nothing, and officers who were well aware of their significance died before they could give orders to destroy them or do so themselves. Our valuable booty was enclosed in a long, narrow envelope, placed in a green folder with holes made to allow water to enter and destroy the document. The folder was labelled Top Secret, to be destroyed and addressed personally to the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces in the Far East. Well done, Moshe, Ruggy said. You've done an excellent job. The contents of the envelope were spread out on the table in front of him. The bright tropical sun streamed into the room through the small gap between the curtains of his cabin, making the polish of the table and the massive crystal ashtray sparkle. The atmosphere was so peaceful that the memory of the destruction and corpses of the automedon seemed immeasurably distant. We were overjoyed at our good fortune. The captured documents were compiled by war cabinet strategists and were the latest assessment of the Empire's military power in the Far East. They contained details of the deployment and equipment of Royal Air Force units, 
data on the strength of naval forces stationed in the region. There was also an opinion on the role of Australia and New Zealand. And in addition, and most poignantly, there was a long paragraph on the possibility of Japan entering the war, accompanied by details of the construction of the fortifications of Singapore. This data is, of course, extremely useful to the German command. We must make the most of what we have got in our hands on, Rog said, and this is how we will do it. We needed diesel fuel. The old Jakob was carrying aviation alcohol. The neutral Japanese had diesel fuel, the Japanese needed aviation alcohol, and now to overcome possible political problems we have invaluable documents. Rog summoned commends. Hmm, I have a job for you, he said. You must take the old Jakob north and help us by participating in the diplomatic process. In the crowded harbour of Yokohama, the crew of the dry cargo ship watched the slow movements of the Norwegian tanker. The anchor was dropped, customs formalities were completed, and tenders and dinghies with people began to leave the tanker one by one towards the shore. Well, envied the observers, Norwegians do not waste time, not like some people. A few hours after the arrival of the tanker again raised the anchor, but only after the return from leave sailors, who had a lot of fun in the city's bars and other hot spots, the whole story became known. The Norwegian tanker turned out to be the long-lost old Jacob, captured by the Germans. It had come into port only to be put ashore by the former crew and again departed to an unknown destination. Old Jacob also left something else ashore, besides the two released crews and a package of documents for the German naval attache. One of the officers of the Atlantis also came ashore, who, together with the documents, was to be transferred to Berlin. Would you say that getting a man to Germany surrounded by a ring of enemies was much more difficult than just putting an envelope in a bag of diplomatic mail? Not at all. The journey of Kamenz, unexpectedly summoned to Berlin for a conference, was simple enough. Indeed, what could be simpler? First on a neutral Japanese ship to Vladivostok, then, with the help of the Russians, who had yet to become allies of the British, on the Trans-Siberian Railroad to Germany. One and home. Kamenz savoured every minute of it. It was a most interesting journey, he told us later, and the means of transportation were certainly more suitable than those that brought him back. The fact is that when our travelling navigator rejoined us aboard Atlantis, it was only after a 16,000-mile submarine voyage that the Germans were no longer persona grata with the commissars. The Barbarossa plan had begun. While Kamenz was enjoying life in the compartment of a Soviet train, an example of political and economic gain was demonstrated in a lost corner of the Pacific Ocean, off the distant Caroline Islands. There the Atlantis stood quietly, taking on board the diesel fuel it needed, while off the Mariana Islands the process of transferring aviation alcohol from the old Jacob to the Japanese was underway. The exchange was made. Rug is it. This is a miniature copy of Roosevelt's policy toward Britain. And one young officer cheerfully remarked, These Japanese are very enterprising fellows. I remember reading a book about how during the last war in King Dao, King Dao, there was a disapproving silence. Still, some people have an amazing ability to say the wrong thing at the wrong time. The vicissitudes of fate make partners of very different people. Success provided for Germany 1940 others equally strange. Kiermet, the fifth and last ship of our so-called first wave of raiders, appeared on the Pacific Communications. I was extremely interested in the unusual way in which this raider, which later sank the 18,000-ton Rangitane, managed to avoid the Royal Navy's nets. Kermit got out of Germany through the back door, passing through the territorial waters of the Soviet Union by the northern sea route, 
and then traversing the freezing Bering Sea escorted by Russian icebreakers. His voyage was an unusual one. Probably under pressure from British diplomacy, the Reds changed their minds about helping us and, when the raider was just halfway across, sent orders to return. The commander of the company refused to obey, and although after a farewell vodka party, the icebreakers were withdrawn, continued on his way despite the lack of nautical charts of the area and the 700-mile strip of pack ice lying ahead of him. Comet seemed to be surrounded by an aura of diplomatic incident. Once he disguised himself so well as a Japanese and took refuge among four Japanese vessels that the captain of one of them even intended to protest. Later off Nauru, he distinguished himself by first beeping Christmas greetings ashore, and then, after inviting people to take refuge in a safe place, opened fire on phosphate mines. The spectacle was quite spectacular, but unfortunately had a negative effect on the eastern end of the axis. The mines were controlled by the Japanese. Neutrality, as we simple sailors found out, covered a great many sins. It could also create quite a few difficulties. Before the meeting with the Automedon, our most profitable in terms of intelligence prey was a 6,000-ton vessel Benati, which, relaying the signal from the Etil King, not only forced us to reopen fire on the Etikil King, but also signed its own death warrant. For when we were convinced that the Etil King was not at fault, and that another vessel had transmitted the signal, we began our search. The circumstances that led to the interception of the signal, as well as the strength and clarity of the signal received in our radio room, definitely indicated that the culprit was somewhere near. But he was not only to be found, that was not too difficult. He was to be captured. It must have been manned by intelligent people. But realizing that they were putting themselves in danger, they continued to do their duty sending out the R signal every minute. The ship was going somewhere ahead of us. It even seemed to me that Atlantis's luck had changed after all. Before we could catch up with it, darkness would fall. We won't be able to make a move until dawn, but by then the ship will be too close to shore for us to feel safe. Rog pondered aloud about the potential enemy. Hmm. I suppose there's a native crew? Apparently so, Mr. Captain, I answered. I wondered why he was suddenly interested in the color of the enemy's skin. Rog turned to Buller, the pilot of the seaplane. Will you be able to fly close enough, so to speak, to walk on the tube? Of course, Mr. Captain, Buller replied, but there may be unforeseen accidents. Very well. Rog smiled contentedly, ignoring the word about contingencies. Then the Arado has a chance to grab some glory. If we can't get the Englishman with shells, we'll take him with panic. Scare away the colored boys on deck. The plan worked. As the seaplane dived almost vertically straight for Bernati's stern, his gunner fired one shot into the water in front of him, and that was the end of it. The effect of the Arado's appearance was quite impressive. When the plane went on her second run, a crowd of Chinese and Indians, obeying only the instinct of self-preservation, were already thrashing about the deck. A few British officers could not restrain the panic-stricken mass of people. The rest proved to be a matter of technique. Our new booty was carrying a very valuable military cargo. 1,000 tons of lead, 100 tons of zinc, and 400 tons of tungsten. The latter was worth its weight in gold in Germany, but it was packed so inconveniently that we were able to transfer only a very small amount of it to the Atlantis. Now we were in grave danger. The airwaves were full of signals. Nevertheless, Rogier said, we were able to deprive the enemy of valuable cargo and that is also a great success. Unlike the doctor, who received a prize of several hundred manila cigars made in the East, 
and almost die trying to get used to them. My men were primarily interested in the correspondence carried on the ship. For the most part, it was very useful to us, but even from that which turned out to be useless, I learned many curious things. It turns out that the British take no less time than we do in the war against bureaucracy. Every sore leg of the elephant Baymang is reported to the London office, and to get a thermometer from the naval deputy in Rangoon, it is necessary to make 23 copies of the document for issue. Our capture of the Bernati may well be classed as a classic of the genre. Such operations are pleasant to remember because their success is not marred by bloodshed. The chance to carry them out is extremely rare, let alone achieve complete success. For the destruction of the automaton Japanese awarded Rogge skillfully made samurai sword, the delivery of which, however, somewhat delayed. It was awarded 18 months after the carnage, 18 months after the fall of Singapore. End. It floated out of the gloom like a grey ghost ship, out of a dark, raging sea. Driven by the wind and the immaculately running diesels, the Atlantis raider reached the islands of despair, Earth. The scream was immediately carried away by the wind. A dreary grey dawn was dawning. The awakened sailors stretched out on deck. A long, dark stretch of reef stretched out before us, illuminated by the first, still pale rays of the rising sun. They seemed like grim monsters poking their ugly heads out of the water. The heavy clouds floated slow and low, almost touching the ground. Sometimes they parted, revealing the black conical peaks of a giant mountain range. The waves crashing against the ship's hull created clouds of fine spray that settled on our frozen cheeks, got under our clothes, dripped into our boots, and pretty soon we felt as if our feet were in a puddle of ice. But we were too excited to pay attention to the weather. All eyes were fixed on the shore. Since the operation to mine the coastal waters around the Cape of Good Hope, we had not yet seen land, and even our native fatherland was on the other side of the world. By Roggy's decision, we came from the sun-warmed areas of the Indian Ocean to this deserted region of Antarctica, closer to the black and white silence of Kerguelen. We were in dire need of fresh water. Nine months had passed since leaving Germany, and our fresh water tanks were threateningly empty. Normally a desalination plant would help in such situations, but it was coal-fired, and the coal consumed from the ballast compartments reduced the radar stability. Water was everywhere, but not a drop of potable water could be found in 28 million square miles of the Indian Ocean. What to do? Roggy, the navigator and I pulled out every map and guidebook we had. Prince Edward Island was unacceptable, because of frequent fogs and many navigational hazards. New Amsterdam and St. Paul were also unacceptable, but for reasons of the opposite nature. They were on the main sea lanes, and we had no desire to be caught unawares by a British cruiser straying there. In the end we chose Kirkwellen, located in an area almost unvisited by ships. This group of islands had countless coves and fjords where we could hide safely, and for a long time. Norwegian whalers used to work there, but it seemed highly probable that there were none at present. Besides, thanks to the German ship Gazelle, we had detailed maps of this region. So in early December, on the first Sunday of Christmas Lent, on a hot and humid afternoon, we changed course and turned south. The horizon line shimmered in a light misty haze, a blue dome of sky with not a single cloud above us. The sun was shining vertically downward, scorching our sweaty shoulders and burning the deck of the Atlantis. We were sailing through a calm area where the winds did not disturb the still mirror of the sea though the mirror was still crooked, distorting the appearance of our handsome ship, reflecting its graceful appearance as a grotesque caricature. Atlantis sliced through the water, 
feeling no resistance at all. Our oldest enemy under the keel remained sluggish and lifeless. If a shadow appeared in the mirror, it was not a breeze, but some change in the composition of the seawater, dull and unhealthy, more like thick oil than refreshing water. I wondered if the hull of the ship was still stained with the viscous substance that was only misleadingly called water. This was the scene when Rog, after prayer, spoke to the crew about the upcoming crossing. We had the good fortune to see the land again, to feel its delightful hardness under our feet, and to enjoy a new portion of fresh, cool air. Fresh air. As we travelled south, the temperature began to drop. Each new day was colder than the previous one. Soon we forgot all about the tropical summer and plunged into the midst of winter itself. Leather coats and jackets, some of them trophies of war, changed our appearance beyond recognition. The weather was changing, and with it the landscape around us was changing. Huge, dark columns of rain squalls moved leisurely over the jagged crests of the waves, as jagged as the waves in the artless symphony. The wind, now usually westerly, grew stronger by the hour. It began with a pleasant breeze, which gradually intensified, changed to a light breeze and finally rumbled, howled in every way, performing a mad concerto in which Atlantis also became an instrument, contributing his voice to the general dissonance of waves and wind. We approached the Roaring Forties, the land of storms admired by schoolboys and memorialized by old sea wolves with some uh, malicious and some uh, romantic word. It didn't take us long to realize. Everything we had read or heard about the area was true. All the winds of the earth seemed to be circling around our masts, as if seeking to draw the ship into a gigantic catastrophic whirlpool. With every hour the sea grew darker and the sky heavier. The clouds raced across the sky at an unbelievable cruising speed, and our ship rhythmically climbed another giant ridge and collapsed from there into the bottomless abyss, after which everything was repeated again. The wounded were streaming into the infirmary. Having felt on my own skin the joys of the turbulence, I realized that in the stories of old sailors who had been in these latitudes, not so much exaggeration, as the Atlantis rose, fell, and swayed, I was thrown out of my bunk, dragged across the cabin, knocked against a closet, then dragged across the floor again and knocked against the bunk. The drawers flew out of the dresser like shells from a cannon, throwing out all their contents so that pretty soon my cabin looked like a dry goods store after a raid. But it was useless to clean up, for everything was instantly back to normal. And in this sea of violence the bunks, and heavy sea bunks at that, were turned around and torn from the powerful hooks on which they hung. To educate the crew, I posted on the bulletin board daily another chapter of a thriller called The Facts About Kerguelen. Unfortunately, the facts could not please anyone. The islands were named after an incorrigible optimist. Frenchman Yves José de Kerguelen Tremor, this frigate commander, decided that he had discovered Australia, and was so happy that without going ashore, he hurried back to France to assemble a full-scale expedition. In the Bastille, where he was being held after the failure of the costly project, he came up with another name for his brainchild, the Island of Despair. The next visitor was more fortunate. He was Captain Cook, and from 1776 to 1873, whalers and seal hunters fished here. They used the island as a resting place on voyages that lasted up to three years. But except for whalers, hunters, and the occasional visiting warships of all nations, the islands remained uninhabited until a certain Mr. Bossier, who probably had a lot of money and little common sense, decided to raise sheep here. For this purpose, he leased a considerable piece of territory from the French government. A few years later, he returned to France, having lost his health and wealth, but never having raised sheep. 
in unfriendly shore washed by icy waters and covered with a dense shroud of fog. Even the ship did not like it here. It creaked and groaned pitifully. At nine o'clock in the morning the ship sounded the battle alarm. Even if the island was uninhabited, it was not worth the risk, and we aimed our guns at the shore. Gradually the low ridge became more clearly visible, a menacing, unattractive pile of black. Its gloomy garb was slightly enlivened only by rare flecks of grey, other geological rocks, and green patches of moss. But as we watched what a couple of weeks ago had been just a dot on the map, and now had become a dull succession of sullen peaks and monotonous plains, our souls soared and our hearts filled with joy. Even the lifeless islands were dear to our hearts. This was land after all. The flow of orders. The tinkling of the machine telegraph. And at last, rattling the chain, the anchor collapsed into the water with a loud splash. For the first time in 250 days. The head was a narrow bottleneck. The entrance to the sheltered anchorage where we were going to settle. This shelter was called Gazelhafen, after the name of the German ship that had surveyed it. On the starboard side stretched a low promontory, we knew that somewhere beyond it, there had once been a settlement of whalers and hunters, and Rog feared that the British might have reoccupied it by setting up an observation post and radio station. So I was appointed head of a detachment that was to go ashore and reconnoiter the area behind the Cape. If there really was a British radio station there, I was ordered to capture it suddenly, without giving the enemy a chance to tell the world of our arrival. We wore civilian clothes, for we pretended to be ordinary harmless fishermen, and for the sake of plausibility we prepared a captured Norwegian vellboat for going ashore. To emit, we disguised automatic rifles. It was easy to get them, but it was impossible to notice them from the shore. And under our clothes, we hid pistols and hand grenades. We expected that such camouflage would help us to get close enough to the enemy, if, of course, there was one on the island. Rogi wished us luck, and we headed for the shore. The sea water was calm, but not in temperature or colour, reminiscent of a Pacific lagoon. As we approached, we scrutinised the shore, looking intently at the grey rocks, rocks of granite, and gentle hillsides. Suddenly the chief petty officer grabbed me by the shoulder and hissed directly into my ear. Hmm, something is moving ashore. There was no turning back. We quickly started the engine and raced toward the shore at top speed, waiting every minute for the firing to begin. That would mean that the war had reached these distant latitudes as well, but nothing happened. We rounded the cape and saw a small open valley with four or five huts standing at the foot of a hill. The huts were situated some distance from the rocks, were well lighted, and seemed absolutely lifeless. One of the huts was equipped with a veranda, which was absolutely inappropriate in these conditions, as if someone had brought a Swiss chalet to Antarctica. Then we noticed a figure moving uncertainly along the water's edge, and obviously watching our approach. It was definitely that something moving on the shore. The sailor, sitting in the bow of the velboat, drew his automatic rifle and pointed it at the strange figure. Nothing happened. This may sound crazy, said the petty officer helmsman, but I think this guy is drunk. He continued to watch. The tension was building. But then the drunk or crazy was illuminated by the sun, and everything became clear at once. It was a magnificent specimen of a sea lion. We returned the machine guns to their hiding place in the bottom of the boat, and then we reached shore. Just reached the shore? I don't think that's a very good expression. We jumped and ran and danced like children. We touched the frozen ground and smelled it. When we felt solid ground under our feet instead of the ever-swaying deck, we forgot our restraint. 
and it was several minutes before we could pull ourselves together and continue our exploration. The first thing we did was to look around the warehouses at the water's edge. They reeked of whale oil, and in one we even found a container of the product, though hardened by time. But no stench could overpower the delicious smell of the earth. I could not imagine that a person, who for so long felt only the salty smell of the sea, could inhale this unique and incomparable aroma with such pleasure. Here even insignificant trifles, like the rusty hinges on the creaking shabby doors, took on an unusual importing. They reminded us of a distant home, of flowering gardens, of the housework that awaits our return. We moved along the narrow path toward the houses. A small brook was babbling nearby, and wisps of stiff brown grass could be seen between the rocks. We were surrounded by mountains so high that they seemed to rest their peaks against the sky. We were approaching a house with a veranda. It was larger than the others, the size of a small hotel. As we opened the door, we saw a long room. There was a stove, a table and two chairs. An old-fashioned lamp hung from the ceiling. In this secluded 19th century dwelling, we were surprised to find a 1936 calendar hanging on the wall with a picture of scantily clad maidens. The date of November 8 was circled. The calendar was printed in Madagascar. After paying moderate attention to the blonde winking invitingly from the wall, we proceeded to search the cabinets near the wall, but, alas, all the bottles found they were empty. Having examined them, a serious challenge for thirsty people, we confirmed our guesses about the nationality of the island's visitors. As tempting, though, of greater scientific interest was another find, half a loaf of bread, which, as far as I could judge, due to the peculiarities of the climate, was quite suitable for food. This could not but surprise me because the literature says that in such conditions mice and rats should actively breed. Through the windows we could see the remains of wire fences, monuments to poor Mr. Lossier's recklessness, enclosing a cattle pen where sheep once bleated pitifully for food. Then we entered the bedroom. Before us was a gigantic old-fashioned bed with brass cones, the lonely Mr. Bossier, Next to his bed, however, was a second, almost identical bed. We also found jars of mouldy jam, rusty fruit jars, and dynamite in the toolbox. We wondered why Mr. Bossier had left the island in such a hurry. On reflection, we concluded that the ship had probably arrived unexpectedly, and he had not even been given time to pack. In the pigsty we found another curious phenomenon resulting from the island climate, two dead mummified pigs. We went around the rest of the buildings, after which we reported to Atlantis that the settlement was uninhabited and there was no trace of the British. Roggy ordered us to return. On board our party was literally attacked by comrades eager to hear the story of the adventures ashore, and I went with Rog to his cabin where he shared his thoughts on our future plans. The main task was to get the Atlantis into a harbour that had never before been entered by such large ships. From our present anchorage to the harbour led a narrow channel about 150 metres wide. It was decided to send dinghies to make measurements and set buoys. The reports of the sailors who performed these tasks seemed to us very satisfactory. The depth was mostly over 20 metres, and they marked a channel about 30 metres wide. We will enter the harbour with the morning tide, Rocket decided. We did so and got into serious trouble. Many even got the feeling that our trek had come to an end. The sickening scraping, cracking, the sound of tearing metal. A shudder that shook the entire ship. A sudden jerk backward, knocking the ground out from under our feet. And finally, a our ship had been hit. It landed on a rock in the centre of the channel we had designated as safe for navigation. 
That morning, when we raised anchor, there was no sign of trouble. The sky was overhanging leaden grey, but the sea was calm and the passage, bounded by buoys, was clearly visible. All that remained was to follow it into the inner harbour. What could be simpler than that? Atlantis entered the channel and moved slowly forward through the water shaded by the coastal rocks. Keeping exactly in the middle between the two rows of boys set out by our sailors measuring the depth. Tinned engine telegraph rang out. The ship was slightly off to the right. The cautious rog ordered a reduction in speed to straighten out. That's when the underwater rock found us. At first, no one realized what had happened. I swayed sharply but held my ground and thought irritably, what the hell? But then someone shouted, Oh my God, we're on something. Rock, spoke another voice. We are stuck on a rock. The first actions were automatic. The order full reverse. Sounded and the engines kicked in, trying hard to pull the ship off the obstacle. There was no effect, only an irritating creaking and grinding that made teeth ache and nerves tense into strings, to which was added another strange threatening sound, the angry grunt of stone digging deeper and deeper into the hull. Roggy to engine room. Is the water coming in? The hatch leading to the double bottom compartments was at this time covered by a pile of sand. Several hundred tons. We'd mostly removed it when we were working on lightening the forward part of the ship, but there was still a lot left and it had to be moved. Again the curses of the exhausted crew, and again the hard, exhausting labour. But then steel gleamed through the yellow sand, and soon the ring of screws on the hatch cover showed itself. But only the opening that gave the engineer access to the inside allowed the sea in Yunzi. The sea water was pressing in from the outside, a challenge to kill Gon's heart. We'll build a caisson over the hatch, he said cheerfully, and then we'll have easy access. For two days, hold number one became center of mysterious technical activity. We heard only the hissing of blow torches and the clanging of hammers. Every few hours the captain was informed about the remaining oxygen. He did not like to see valuable material actively wasted. Otherwise we would not know anything about the progress of the work at all. We were simply brushed aside. Of course, experts are working. But when we were finally allowed to evaluate the fruits of their labours, we were speechless with admiration. Mac we saw a beautiful new structure twelve metres below. A kind of dog kennel made of steel, built over a hole, with exactly the same hole in the roof. A complex shelter equipped with air ducts and telephone communication. Nearby stood an engineer, raring to try it all out for himself. Kilgorn and his companion who whispered so badly that he was a constant object of ridicule by the ship's wags. Climb. As Kilgorn said, the first thing they got to see was a few fish that had come to see what was going on and were looking at the men in bewilderment. Kilgorn kept reporting by phone everything he saw. The frames are bent, the keel plate is missing, the frame seems strong enough, and after a pause there was an optimistic statement. All in all, everything is all right. The guys were right about that. As it turned out later, the leak did not affect the Atlantis's seaworthiness or speed. In the midst of hard work, Christmas came. We tried to forget about serious problems for a while, at least hide them behind a facade of cheerfulness. We tried hard, but not everyone was very good at it. In any case, the comrades of Herman who had left us were clearly not having much fun. Fehler, our organizational genius, took his mind off his triggers for a while and got busy designing and making Christmas decorations. He built a Christmas tree out of a broomstick, in which the needles were pieces of rope and wire, sprayed with green paint for added effect. Drog became Santa Claus and handed out presents to the crew. Trophies taken from the ships we had sunk, 
shoes, cigarettes, chocolates, pencils, etc. When the captain, looking resplendent in his ceremonial attire, came on deck, the sailors piously sang, I came down from the heights of paradise. It was a shock to Roggy's religious sensibilities, but he realized that the men were motivated only by the best of motives. That evening we dined with a crew that had shown their best during our trek, and who had many challenges ahead of them. Our celebration had a nostalgic tinge, made even more so by the news of the bombings back home. I particularly remembered how our signalman Winter, usually a jolly, jovial man, the soul of any company, sat quietly and sadly looking at a photograph of the children and wife left at home. At this party we had a rare opportunity to hear the openly expressed opinions of the crew, from which it was clear that the romantic illusions surrounding the Atlantis campaign had diminished. It was obvious that most of the reservists, despite their unquestioning loyalty to the ship and captain, we never doubted that for a moment, were fed up. The married men wanted to go home, although the unmarried men didn't seem to mind sitting out the war on Kerguelen. It was an evening of revelations and unexpected discoveries, and later, as the evening hymn blared over the dark waters, I thought long and hard about the revelations I had heard. Eventually I came to the conclusion that there was nothing to worry about. There were good, reliable guys on the team. The officers, too, were depressed by the prospect of war, now threatening to drag on indefinitely, but our misgivings did not prevent us from remaining devoted to the cause. It was the same with the sailors. Whatever they thought of the politicians or the role these gentlemen had assigned them, they would continue to work as a crew. True, one would still like to know, or what? What kind of bizarre fate had commanded humans to hunt and kill each other on ocean expanses so vast that humans seemed like specks of dust in comparison? But such philosophizing had no place on Kerguelen. There was no time for it. It was necessary to deal with the phenomenon that had earned these islands the name land of a thousand winds. The watch on the bridge was increased, and as a precaution we dropped the second anchor, although, in spite of the increasing fury of the wind, the sea remained comparatively calm. The deck was covered with snow. No stars could be seen on account of the low cloud, and as the men free from watch began to sing Christmas songs, their mates remained alert. They waited every minute for the signal, after which the darkness would be torn by the flash of guns, and our shells would fly into the sleek grey hull of the enemy ship, on which they also sang Christmas songs. It's an interesting Christmas, a thought-provoking one. During our stay on Kerguelen, most of the sailors were able to spend no more than a few hours on the long-awaited land. People had so much work to do that a long walk was only dreamed of. In this respect, I and the landing parties accompanying me were more fortunate. A waterfall had been discovered in the mountains, and we were instructed to find ways and means of bringing clean glacial water to the ship. A congenial assignment, albeit prefaced by Roggy's warning. Murder in given sakes, motor don't let feeler use too much dynamite for this purpose. Getting water to the ship proved to be a tricky business. We found out that in order to use the waterfall, we would have to build a pipeline 1,100 metres long that would run down an almost sheer slope, a flat bank, and over the water surface. This problem was solved by using all the pipes of the ship's firefighting and fuel transfer systems. In two days, the tanks of the Atlantis were filled with 1,000 tons of the cleanest, coldest, and most refreshing liquid we had ever had to drink. The operation had to be thought out with great care, for the distance was great, and the number of pipes at our disposal was disappointingly small. All of them were used. We had a lot of adventures. We were considered lucky for a reason. I organized a large expedition to explore the area beyond our hilly paradise. 
we explored a stream flowing between lifeless cliffs and dangerous swamps. For this we had to make a magnificent excursion, accompanied by the cheerful murmuring of mountain streams, pouring their clear waters into powerful streams striving downwards towards the sea. The landscape evoked nostalgic memories of the south of Germany. The lure of the mountains had the strongest effect on our Bavarians, and despite my constant reminders that the purpose of our expedition was to find food, they continued to be mesmerized by the surrounding beauty, dreaming of climbing to the glittering glacier on Mount Ross, towering above us at almost 2,000 meters. In the end, I decided to compromise and suggested they climb a more accessible, from my point of view, mountain. Unfortunately, it came to me too late that I, as a responsible officer, had to accompany them. Our Bavarians turned out to be mountain goats. They easily climbed up, clinging to barely visible ledges and cracks, while I, with great difficulty, reached the top and was half dead from fatigue. Was it worth it? I looked pensively over the wild landscape below. I had never seen anything like it before or since. The plains seemed polished in the sunlight shimmering through the clouds. They were flat, the effect of the glaciers and the merciless wind. I glanced toward the anchorage. The Atlantis seemed like a small child's toy. A bleak landscape? Yes. Lifeless? Absolutely but nevertheless immeasurably appealing to us, having not seen land for so long, and there's no telling when we'll see it in the future. In we had drunk enough from the source of spiritual joys and moved on to bodily needs. That is, to the goal of our expedition. We have provided ourselves with water. Now we would like to add food to it. But where to get it? There were no flowers blooming on this land, not even trees that could enliven the bleak black and white color of glaciers and granite. There were no animals here, no birds either. What to do? As it turned out, Kerguelen could offer us only one plant. This stunted, stunted vegetable was part of the local wild flora, which, apart from it, consisted of sparse wisps of grass and moss. But it was plentiful. We picked quite a few cabbages for the team to sample. The vegetable was not bad when raw, but it was impossible to cook it. When heated, it began to spread a disgusting odour that quickly filled all the rooms of the ship. During this period, there were only a few prisoners left aboard the Atlantis. They remained in the POW room the entire time they were on the islands. Rog decided that if they realized where we were and for what purpose, it would endanger not only us but also other German Navy vessels. True, they, like the rest of the crew, were given a cabbage dish. And since it was impossible to hide the stench that accompanied the preparation of this local specialty, I often wondered what they thought about it and whether our security measures made sense. Wandering around the island in search of food, we once spotted a flock of rabbits that somehow, I don't know how geographers and naturalists will explain this phenomenon, managed to survive in this lifeless area. Rabbits. In the first minutes we looked at the rodents with sympathy and obvious sympathy. But the thought of rabbit roast made us salivate, and without a moment's hesitation we all opened fire. When the firing subsided, we went to collect the corpses of the fallen on the battlefield, but there were none, not a single one. By some miracle, every single rabbit had managed to slip away. The marksmen of the German Navy were shamed and sent back to the Dinghais in disgrace. How Brother Rabbit must have laughed at our disgraceful retreat, who must have been watching us from his hiding place. Fela, however, was more fortunate. When he had brought his hunting rifle on board in Bremen, we had only marvelled at his optimism, but now he had managed to shoot some ducks. That was very good. Of course, we had gotten used to shooting rabbits, but from then on our menu consisted of Kerguin cabbage and curried rabbit, or as a nice change, 
curried cabbage and rabbit. A lucky find was a large colony of mussels, and we spent many pleasant hours collecting these exquisite-tasting shellfish. Some of our amusements may have seemed childish, and they probably were. The doctor, for example, took a dashing ride on a sea lion. We enjoyed photographing penguins and even caught one, though we had political rather than practical aims. Our captain had instructed that officers were to appear on the bridge only properly dressed. Whether we liked it or not, under all circumstances we had to wear a neat black bow tie, the mark of a German naval officer. So we presented the captain with a penguin, adorned with the prescribed tie wrapped around his fat neck. Rog thanked us for the gift, but ignored the hint. One day we decided to experiment with dynamite, of which there was quite a lot in abandoned warehouses on the island. We spent hours on end firing pistols and rifles at it, hiding behind a large boulder after each shot but our hope for a big boo was never realised. Ferry the dog's experience on the island was extremely unfortunate and was confined to only one occasion, after which he was infinitely happy to be back on board again. Once on shore, the little Scotch terrier began fussily sniffing for unfamiliar odour. Yet he scurried around the shore and expressed his feelings with loud yapping. His euphoria lasted no more than two minutes. The troublemaker was attacked by a flock of seagulls, and with such fury that the bosun had to rescue the baby and send him back on board to his master. Meanwhile, our seaplane was also busy with business. The pilots were making regular patrols in the skies above our remote refuge. They made observations to prevent the enemy from taking us by surprise and at the same time studied the geography of the island. In particular, it was aerial reconnaissance that determined that the glaciers had slid down the slopes of Mount Ross, not the ridge to the southwest, as the island's less technically equipped explorers had previously claimed. Many other inaccuracies also surfaced, and in between we made a new topographic survey of the area which will prove very useful to future visitors to the island. In general, we were not bored on the island, but I was glad when the repairs were completed, the anchors were raised and we carefully moved through the unfortunate channel into the open bay. And in a few hours the Atlantis was already sailing in the open sea. Behind the stern there was an unfriendly shore, covered with a white roof of clouds. Soon it will turn into a vague dark spot against the sky and sea. On this shore the body of our comrade and the cross with his name remained forever. Dark awaited us again. A few days passed and we were again under the scorching rays of the hot tropical sun. At the end of January we began operations in the Seychelles area, northeast of Madagascar. We began the pursuit of the British dry cargo ship Mandasaur which we managed to defeat only with the help of pilots, through the periscope of the German submarine U-43. The steamer on the horizon looked 100-ish. There was no doubt about it. The first torpedo went off. Second, third. Three white foamy trails on the blue water. An explosion that crushed the target, perfectly visible in the periscope. It was clearly another success for the submariners, and the crew had every reason to feel legitimate satisfaction. How could the German submariners have known that the ship they had just sunk was commanded by a German officer, had a German crew, was returning from one of the most dangerous adventures known in the history of warfare at sea, and that its cargo was vital to the Reich? Yes. The Spay Bank is a ship I won't soon forget, not only because of its terrible end, but also because it served us well. We met this 5,000-ton British dry cargo ship less than a week after the sinking of the Mandasaur, captured her, put her crew in command and for several weeks used her on reconnaissance missions for the Atlantis. Command was given to Lieutenant Schneidwind, a former chief mate on the Tannenfels, 
a German ship preparing to sail from Somalia, whom Rog requisitioned and took aboard the Atlantis, against the open displeasure of his former captain. Spybank, we renamed her Doggerbank, remained with us until March, when we sent her home. The ship had to be repaired and refitted for further use in the German Navy. In May she arrived in Bordeaux and remained in dock for several months where she was fitted with an additional mine hold. At the beginning of 1942 it again went to sea, also under the command of Lieutenant Schneidwind with the order to install mines in the area of Cape Town. Already the very beginning of the campaign was unsuccessful. The ship was caught in a fierce storm, during which the mines broke off their fasteners and began to roll around in the hold. This continued until the crew, who were in grave danger, managed to reattach the deadly cargo. The ship reached Cape Town without incident, but here attracted the attention of enemy aircraft. Signalmen relayed that a ship called the Levenbank was following from New York to Cape Town, and the plane withdrew, accepting the explanation. Schneidwind certainly deserved the high praise given him by Rock. The cold-blooded young man brought the ship at Table Bay, so close to shore that he was frequently illuminated by the beams of British searchlights, but he calmly went about his business. Staying no more than a mile from shore observers, dropped overboard half of the mines on board. The rest of the mines, ready for installation, were lying on deck, so the crew of Spybankers, with some apprehension, that is the restrained expression would use Schneidewinde, noticed the approach of the British cruiser class Birmingham, but all turned out safely. From the cruiser, which approached at a distance of a mile, illuminated the ship with a searchlight. But only the searchlight beam was directed rather low, and the mine-filled deck remained in darkness. The cruiser called out, What vessel? Levenbank Schneidwind replied, proceeding to Durban. Good night. We wish the crew a good voyage and the captain a good night. Thanking the polite British, Spaybank continued on his way, but setting the remaining mines in the area of Cape Agulhas was spotted by a British auxiliary cruiser carrying several hundred soldiers who could easily be distinguished on deck. This time the Spaybank passed the danger under the name of the Inverbank. Hune soon smiled upon the young lieutenant and his vessel. After a second voyage to Yokoma, during which they met a Thor raider commanded by Captain Gumprich. The ship was sent to Germany with a strategic war cargo on board. This was a week ahead of schedule, which couldn't have come at a better time. It was this change of plans that hastened the end of the ship, an end not only filled with bitter irony but a terrible one. Of the entire crew, only one man was saved all the others, having plunged into the only lifeboat suitable for the purpose, died an agonizing death after a long wander on the high seas. Some of them jumped overboard. Others shot themselves in the forehead. Others obediently waited for their end in the boat. Their bodies dried up from dehydration. But before the tragedy occurred in January, when the Spaybank was still with us, Rog and I were most interested in a top-secret message received from our distant Admiralty. It was very exciting. The pocket battleship Skier, whose first trip to sea was marked by the famous incident with the auxiliary cruiser Jervis Bay, is back at sea. Moreover, it is very near, and we will have an opportunity to see the German warship and talk to compatriots outside our narrow circle. So far only Rogage and I knew of the forthcoming rendezvous, and in conversations among ourselves repeatedly mentioned that they would like to mark such an occasion with another victory. They say desire is the father of thought, and in our case it turned out to be the father of action. On November 2, we spotted the fast Norwegian tanker Ketchi Breivik. A tanker? And just at the moment when both we and Skier and the Italians in Somalia desperately need fuel, we decided to attack at night. 
Roggy was particularly concerned with complete surprise. By this time, in an effort to avoid unnecessary bloodshed, we had installed a rather ingenious system of searchlights by which on order. Our ship was brightly illuminated and the inscription became clearly visible. Halt! Do not use the radio! We knew, of course, that the Admiralty insists that captains, no matter what the circumstances, radio to signal a raider attack, or at least make such an attempt. But in the case of the Ketty Breivig, we had reason to take the risk of a more humane approach. A single hit would be enough to ignite the tanker's cargo, turning it into a bonfire in which its entire crew would roast. We'll only get a charred hull as a trophy. No, do not fire on the ship, Rogge instructed. We'll try to make do with a sign and a warning shot. Yes, light. And in a moment our deck, hitherto safely hidden by the cover of night darkness, was flooded with light like a sports arena during an international rally. Gun number one, fire. There was the rattle of a shot, the whistle of a shell, and the furious shriek of an artillery officer. Damn idiot. You've hit the chimney. A cloud of vapour rose above the Ketty Brevig. The vessel stopped with commendable rapidity. For a few seconds we anxiously awaited the appearance of tongues of flame, but for some inexplicable reason there were none. The dinghy overboard. As I gave the order I regretted for the umpteenth time that the war had entrusted me with such an occupation. A good job, I thought, as we approached the wrecked tanker, to climb on a ship where even an accidentally thrown match can cause tragedy, and to try to save a ship which one of us has turned into a death trap. Apparently, I was not the only one who had doubts about the safety of the Ketty Breivik. The frequent splashing of water off the side of the ship testified to the rapidity with which the Chinese crew was leaving the vessel. As I climbed on deck, I saw a Chinese man emerge from the darkness. What is the name of the ship? I asked. To the sight of me, his narrow oriental eyes became round with fright. With a cry of horror, he sprang to the side and leaped into the sea. I, wondered, I thought if I looked such a fearsome monster that I must be escaped even in this unsafe way. Shrugging my shoulders, I grinned unhappily. Okay, then I'll figure out the answers to all the questions myself. Turning on my flashlight, I looked for the radio room, which I quickly found by the sign on the door. What kind of cargo was the Ketty Brevig carrying? And is there any cargo at all? Maybe the ship was carrying ballast? I had to search the captain's cabin thoroughly. I finally found the cargo manifest. Well, things are even better than we'd hoped. The ship has 4,500 tons of diesel and 6,000 tons of other fuels. Back on the Atlantis with the Chinese who had been fished out of the water, we decided that the Ketty Breivig had to be salvaged. So Fela and I headed back to return the frightened Easterners by force, if necessary, to their duties. A council of war was held aboard the tanker. Sitting around a table in the dark, the only source of light was a pocket flashlight, Fela, myself, the Norwegian captain, and the mechanic discussed the problems that had arisen. There were quite a few because our bad shot had caused the pressure to drop in the boilers. We suggested adding water. It won't work. The Norwegian captain shook his head. We don't have hand pumps. Then how do you dilute the vapour on shore? It comes from the shore. That's original. We had nothing more to say. That's not the most original thing. The mechanic grinned that we have on our ship. As it turned out later, he was not exaggerating. We had tried everything, but it seemed that there was no way of getting water into the boilers from the Ketty Brevig's more than oddly designed tanks. It was necessary to consider how not to let out what little steam was left. One of our men volunteered to reach, wrapped in blankets, 
through the cloud of scalding hot steam to the main valve and close it. A second volunteer stood nearby on the deck, ready to take the first man's place in case of failure. But the first volunteer came back alive and well, although he did lose consciousness when he was on deck. And when the hissing stopped, it proved that he had completed the task. Well, let's consider it a certain success, although the situation was still complicated. We discussed at length whether to fill one of the boilers with seawater, but that would have shortened its service life considerably, and the fuel pumps were not working. The situation was saved by our mechanics showing up in time with one of their as always ambitious ideas. They measured the main steam pipe, and that same night a shroud was made in the Atlantis workshops to cover the rupture. By dawn the hole was patched. Now all that remained was to raise the steam pressure, but how? Fila took up the task and ordered to chop all the furniture on the tanker for firewood. The first revolutions of the Keti Brevig were made thanks to the energy generated by tables, chairs and chests of drawers. After that I returned to the Atlantis, and we headed a convoy of three other ships, the Tannenfels, the Spaybank and the Keti Brevig, to the rendezvous point. Our rendezvous with the shear was unknown to the crew, and when the forward lookout shouted I see the masts, a mysterious light flashed in Roggy's eyes. Then word came that the ship we were heading for appeared to be a military ship. The men, as usual, took their seats according to their battle schedules. Rog and I exchanged sly smiles as we both sensed the unspoken questions hanging in the air. What the devil? Why are we heading straight for a warship? So the captain chosen this method of suicide. We continued to keep our comrades in the dark until the lookout reported three gun turrets fore and aft. This meant that we had one of our own in front of us. The crew of the Shear was also surprised. Instead of the expected one vessel, four showed up for the rendezvous. We proudly displayed our prizes, then approached the starboard side of our big brother, feeling like slovenly merchants next to an armoured knight. The wind had reached hurricane force. Huge waves tossed Atlantis like a child's toy. From the Shear sent a sympathetic message that they quite understand the impossibility of our arrival on board until the weather improves. But Roggy was a stubborn man and immediately replied, I will still arrive. He was sure that the Norwegian Velboats were superior to the commanding boat of a pocket battleship, but even if they were not, we would still get to the Sheer, even if we had to swim. Good thing we didn't have to resort to extreme measures after all. After skillful manoeuvring, as the waves were as big as a house, we still found ourselves on the deck of the Big Brother. The crossing was not pleasant, however, and just as I prepared to climb up on the deck of the battleship, our boat crashed into a hollow between the waves, and the damned ship chose that very moment to follow her. A good party was made for us, but the storm was so violent it was the storm not the cordial hospitality of the naval sailors, that when it was time to return I stayed on the shear. At the critical moment Rog was able to jump into the veil boat, and I fell behind, losing my chance to return. Although it was much more comfortable here, I was very much concerned that the Atlantis might for some reason suddenly leave and I would be left behind. But it all worked out. We made a joint passage southward to calmer waters, where we were able to spend our time in all pleasantness. Some of the petty officers and sailors from the Atlantis had been invited to the Shear and were able to experience the deepest satisfaction in showing off to the newcomers of the battleship's crew. They were real veterans compared to the salaried men who had seen the sea for the first time three months before. We also exchanged gifts, quite generous, for they cost us nothing. From our trophies we provided each member of the Sheer team with a fountain pen. Later we had reason to regret our generosity. A few years later we were surprised to learn that Sheer had taken the trophies himself. 
The reciprocal gift caused us some confusion. Before rendezvousing with us, Cheer captured the English refrigerator Duquesa with a cargo of eggs. There were literally millions of them. We were allotted 150,000 of them, for two weeks each crew member and each prisoner. None of them had seen fresh eggs for many months. H.H. counted specially from six to twelve pieces a day. We ate boiled eggs, fried eggs, and scrambled eggs. We enjoyed all kinds of omelettes and scotch eggs. When we got tired of eggs in every conceivable form, there were still a few thousand of them left. They partially began to spoil and gave off an unbearable stench. So no one was sorry when finally they were ordered to be thrown overboard. The fuel from our last prize was given to the seer, the Tannenfels, and us. Its supply seemed inexhaustible. Later, while in this remote area of the Indian Ocean, we embarked on a most serious job, transferring fuel to Italian submarines. This was an interesting assignment for us because we had not yet had the opportunity to get to know the Southern Allies, unless you count the occasional shipment of prisoners to Somalia. From what we saw, we had the impression later confirmed that the skill and spirit of the Italian crew depended entirely on their commander. Many of the Italian submarine commanders were experienced and brave men. But, in general, it seemed to us that the senior officers of the Italian Navy lacked what Americans call know-how. In addition, we were shocked at the width and depth of the social gulf that separated officers and crew. As a rule, the Italian officer lived in the best conditions the environment could afford, but the sailors existed in truly bestial conditions and on a starvation diet. The lack of general enthusiasm is therefore hardly surprising. Meanwhile, when we received urgent orders to secure the bunkering of the submarine Perla, bound from Massawa, we hurried to the rendezvous, driven by curiosity, and arrived at the rendezvous point at 33rd degree south latitude, right on schedule. No submarine was there. With legitimate frustration, we waited. Roggy grumbled and our patience gradually wore thin. Then, in violation of all the rules of radio silence, we received a radiogram from the submarine in which the Italians wondered why they are forced to wait. The submarine was at 33 degrees latitude. We picked her up easily, but so could any British cruiser prowling in the immediate vicinity. It could have caught us both, and then trying to show solidarity with a country at the southern end of the axis would have been very costly to Germany. However, we safely loaded seven tons of lubricating oil on the Perla. That should have been enough for her for a long time. But her commander, after praising our amazing success, had the nerve to demand another 70,000 cigarettes. We said goodbye to the steer with regret. Such feelings can be felt by people who know that each new day may be their last, saying goodbye to their compatriots and doubting whether they will ever see each other again. We felt more alone than we had before we met the pocket battleship. Compared to the steel decks of the Steer, its powerful gun turrets, the Atlantis seemed small and somehow not serious. It was as if the battleship brought us a message from the almost forgotten keel, with all its pleasantries. But as commends, the old merchant seaman so edge is so stiflingly hot on these steel ships. You must agree that our Atlantis is much more comfortable. We are only now beginning to realize how widespread the raiding activity has become and how difficult it is to organize it on such a huge scale. We heard news of our victories, of how our colleague, the Penguin, had taken over the entire Norwegian Antarctic whaling fleet. Penguin Long pursued his prey, watched the fleet scattered over a vast space, staying out of sight until he found the location of the floating fish factory. Approach the fish factory, seize it, find out the secret code, call the unsuspecting whalers one by one and seize them. You say there's no trickery involved. There might be. 
but this seizure was of the utmost importance to the country and, unlike so many sordid pages of the war, was without a single casualty. This episode is all the more remarkable because the entire fleet was subsequently withdrawn to occupied France and arrived there safe and sound. Penguin inflicted heavy damage on the enemy and came close to the record of sunk tonnage set by us. He was the only raider to succeed, if we had known that he had had only three months left. We also heard about the losses, among which was the only Italian auxiliary cruiser that went to sea. He was unlucky, the ship immediately ran into a British auxiliary cruiser. Many of our supply ships were sunk or captured. Nevertheless, the raider's area of operation was so vast, and the British felt such an urgent need to concentrate all their main forces in the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean, that we, even after hearing that we were being hunted by the British auxiliary cruiser Ranchi, north of Chagos, enjoyed freedom. I suppose the enemy didn't realize it. Cheer in the second combat campaign did not achieve great success. After the war, its activities were widely criticized. It was argued that it lacked boldness, which could lead to the heaviest losses of the Allies. Those who held this point of view argued that the British in the South Atlantic or the Mediterranean was not a single ship capable of withstanding the heavy armaments sheer. On the other hand, being at sea during the war, we could not fully comprehend all that seems obvious to cabinet scholars with all the necessary documents at their disposal. Be that as it may, it was the presence of the sheer that led to the destruction of the Allied lines of communication. As for the Atlantis, we account for one-fifth of all merchant tonnage sunk by surface ships of the German Navy. Hmm, cockroaches muttered the sailor standing next to me. He sounded surprised and disgusted. I stepped into the dirty galley and looked into the corner where the sailor's gaze was fixed. A black rivulet was moving across the slick floor. It was the first time I'd been behind the scenes of a passenger ship, and while I hadn't expected the sterile cleanliness of a luxury cruise ship, the Zamzam's galley was worse than my worst nightmares. Not a grouches, the sailor repeated, grimacing. They were everywhere. Specimens five centimetres long crawled out from all sides, moving in impressive groups. It was as if they were trying to leave the sinking ship. Hmm, sir? said another sailor who happened to look into the galley. It stinks in here. As I moved toward the gangway leading to the upper deck, I thought, it may stink in here, but I dread to think what a stink it will raise when the Allies find out about the Zamzam. The second Lusitania. V.I., that's what they called our sacrifice. A new act of barbarism was how they described the sinking. Over the next weeks, the Zamzam story was widely reported in the Western press as yet another example of the Germans' disregard for international laws, involving 138 citizens of then neutral America. International incident. We attacked the Zamzam on April 17, hiding under the cover of night and the darkness of the western sky while its silhouette was clearly visible against the first dawn rays. We sank it after a patient pursuit of many hours, marking by this operation a temporary return to our first hunting grounds. The South Atlantic, the story got us national attention and we were honored with articles and letters in the Times and Life. One of the writers stated, they've gone too far, it's time to get them theirs means us. Expressing his program slogan, this writer, a resident of Brownwood, Texas, if these vultures want to contact you here, I think all Texans are ready to meet them halfway. Contact. The actual story of the sinking of that damned Egyptian vessel was truly fantastic and was the result of coincidence. The vessel we fired on from a distance of three miles was not at all what we thought it was. 
Zam Zam was the victim of a coincidence, a chance coincidence, to make sense of it. One has to go back to the peaceful year 1937 to Roggy's friendly visit to England. It was a royal summer and royal events. Roggy, who was representing Germany in a six-metre yacht regatta held during the coronation festivities of King George VI, was enjoying himself in England, was welcoming German teams with great hospitality. How different, he thought, was the situation in 1937 from that in Anglo-German relations a few years earlier? And when he saw an advertising poster welcoming German yachtsmen to Torbay, he baked it from a newspaper vendor as a souvenir. It would serve the Anglophobes back home well, he thought. The southwest coast of Great Britain was enveloped in an aura of genuine camaraderie, and many a glass of wine was raised to true friendship between British and German naval officers. It was at this time that Roggy received an invitation to visit the Naval War College at Dartmouth. Rogjnov Dartmouth. As a professional, he admired the unbreakable traditions the town embodied as an artist and a yachtsman. He admired the beauty of the scenery. The vast bay, the small boats bobbing on its blue surface against the backdrop of lush green hills, grey and brown cliffs. Only one thing surprised him. Among the warships at the anchorage were two merchant ships, not the first of their youth, with four masts. You have two strangers here, he said. I thought only warships came here. The principal of the college glanced at the steamers, shrugged his shoulders carelessly, and replied, No, you, you see them here very often. They are local, you might say. They are the BB Company's steamers. We charter them quite often. Troop transportation and all that, you know? Of course, Rug replied, and never thought about it again until the fateful night of April 16, 1941. Catch up at dusk, attack at dawn. Ordered Roggy when he received a report about the appearance of a four-masted steamer on the horizon. Catch up at dusk, attack at dawn. An old recipe, a time-honoured mixture. It was a method we had used many times in the Indian Ocean, where it was now too hot for us. But this time there was some deviation, no warnings. Our shells must hit the target at once, with no delay that would give the enemy an advantage. Rapid fire until the enemy surrenders or is destroyed. They don't know yet, said Cash, when he heard that the enemy, without lights or flag, was following his course. They know nothing of the unpleasant surprise that awaits them in the morning. We had run away so long, pursued at the heels of the English in waters where we ourselves had fanned a great fire, that we were glad of the opportunity to be hunters again. Especially as we had before us a worthy victim, a BB Company liner, either used as an auxiliary cruiser or carrying troops. Only Rog, the man who gave the orders, did not look pleased. He was recalling the events of four years ago, the peaceful waters of Dartmouth, where he had first seen such a vessel and learned how it was used. We charter them quite often. Troop transportation and stuff like that. The first salvo underflew. The second overflew. The third blew the ship's radio room to splinters. The fourth and fire erupted in various places on the deck. And not a single shot in return. It's incomprehensible. We continued shelling. After eight minutes, a signal lamp flashed on board the enemy vessel. It was asking us to cease fire. Majiting, cease fire. The deed was done, and with a light heart we headed towards the hit vessel. As we approached, we saw half-dressed people scurrying about the deck, among them many women and children. Every minute the crowd of passengers grew larger, a BB liner? A troop transport? What the hell? Panic reigned on the deck of the Zamzam. Dinghies were leaving one after another, but they were mostly sailors, not passengers. Good God. What is it? 
and then I was stunned to hear the sound of a divine hymn over the waters. In one of the boats someone was playing nearer to thee, O Lord, on a cornet with great feeling. Hmm, so muttered someone behind me. I never saw such a crowd on board a British warship. His sarcasm was as pleasant as salt poured on an open wound. Give me a gun. I'll shoot the bastard, roared Rog, pounding his fist on the bulkhead with all his might. The scoundrel, a skinny Arab sailor, was climbing on our deck quite calmly. He took the rope we had thrown him to tie up the overcrowded dinghy as an invitation to save his valuable skin personally, and climbed up, leaving forty unfortunates to dangle in the dinghy near the hull of the Atlantis. Scum carefully made his way to the rail, tumbled over it onto the deck, and began thanking the shocked sailors with a radiant smile. Rogge grabbed for his holster. Fortunately, he didn't have one. Hey, get the bastard out of my sight, he growled, or I'm sending him overboard. The Arab, who never realized what he had done wrong, was hastily and not quite politely dragged aside. We threw the other end. It was only then that we saw the flag. It hung dejectedly on the Zamzam's ruined stern. It had been raised after the shelling had begun. It was the flag of Egypt. We had no way of knowing that the BB liner had changed owners only a few months before the war broke out. Britain had sold it to Egypt, and now it was carrying 320 passengers, mostly women and children, instead of the expected troops. In the water around the Zamzam floated people, men and women, desperately fighting for life. Among them we noticed a woman cradling a baby. The Egyptian crew was in such a hurry to get away from the ship that the woman was forced to jump and fell into the water between the dinghy and the sinking ship. But even after that the sailors did not consider it, their duty to pick her and her child up and continue to row away with enthusiasm. Only a few minutes later she was picked up by an American corpsman on a raft. The lifeboats were for the most part half empty, the result of panic among the crew. Passengers who did not get help had to help each other. The Americans, twenty young volunteers on their way to de Gaulle's French Field Hospital, performed well. They rescued women and children, pulling them out of the water onto drifting rafts until a rescue operation could be organized. None of the priests made a disgusting spectacle of it. Having taken care to save his own skin, he began to broadcast loudly, apparently deciding in this way to take care of raising the morale of the community. This is God's punishment for your sins. But the other clergymen, there were many missionaries on board the Zamzam, tried their best to calm the sobbing women and children, who were in a state of severe shock. On the deck of the Zamzam, I was met by an elderly British captain. He was sullen and cold. Why the hell didn't you signal earlier? I asked. What were you waiting for? Why bring it to this? Because, the officer grinned bitterly, your third shot destroyed our signal lamp. He was still holding the torch with which he had managed to stop the shelling. Smith was one of the very few poised and cool-headed men on the ship, the other being the young Egyptian cadet, who had not left the captain's side during the shelling. He remained unshakenly calm even afterward, when the rest of his countrymen besieged us with petitions demanding their release as representatives of a neutral country. Both on the bridge of the ship and in captivity he stood by his captain. Until I met Smith, I had no idea what fish we had caught. But as he accompanied me on my inspection of the vessel, he made some explanations, and initiated me into the substance of the problems we were about to encounter. The Zamzam carried more than a hundred clergymen of twenty different denominations. Also on it were seventy-six women, five of them pregnant. Of the thirty-five children on board, some were little older than infants. Among the passengers were also an American sanitation crew, several elderly Britons 
officers' wives, several highly photogenic Greek nurses, and one Frenchwoman. Smith, from what I understand, didn't have much trouble with the passengers. Before the Atlantis arrived, they were divided into three warring groups. The American missionaries who wanted the bar permanently closed, the American orderlies who demanded that it be open all the time, and the British who didn't mind it closing at 10 and 30. Many passengers showed up aboard Atlantis in their nightgowns and had not had time to bring anything with them. So Rogier sent me and Fela, handing us an axe instead of a key, to bring all the clothes we could from the Zamzam. I told Smith about it. He grinned wryly. What a coincidence, he said. I was just planning a costume party for the passengers. Nothing official just wanted to cheer them up a little. Ironic, isn't it? Watch your backs. And a pile of women's underwear flew over the railing of the Atlantis. Helmsman Cross wolfed upward from the waiting boat and frowned as something lacy and silky fell on his head. But he tried to catch the light scraps nonetheless. Hmm, careful. He wailed. You must respect other people's property. At the same time, he deftly picked up a pink rag that the wind was about to throw into the water. I can't say we tried very hard to pack properly. The sailors grabbed everything hanging on the ropes and hangers, pulled out the contents of the crates, and threw them into the boat. The old boat was already lurching, and we were afraid that it would sink at any moment. Neither Fela nor I were happy about the assignment, and we moved about the boat as fast as possible. Down in the engine room, the water was rushing into the breach with a deafening roar, hitting the bulkheads with the force of a heavy hammer, swirling and bubbling around the machinery. The ship scraped and creaked, and the tilt grew greater by the minute. When the water reached the level of 3.5 metres, its weight was distributed in such a way that the ship became almost on an even keel. This gave us the opportunity to spend another four or five hours on it, and no longer paying attention to cockroaches, to empty its storerooms. We delivered fruit juice and lobsters, frozen geese and ducks to the Atlantis, and naturally we didn't forget the contents of the bar. Of course, we caught the wrong game, but since we did, we should have brought everything we could get our hands on. En route to Europe aboard the blockade breaker Dresden, the Americans began to protest their conditions. They particularly emphasized the fact that they had left the United States aboard an unarmed vessel flying the flag of a non-belligerent nation, and the Egyptian officers handed us a verbose petition in which they asserted that Egypt has until today been a non-military sovereign state. Under international laws, the Zamzam is a neutral unarmed vessel. Why, then, if the Zamzam was captured by mistake, did we sink it? What right did we have to decide its fate? What was the purpose of destroying a passenger ship? For us, the answer was quite clear. Egypt was a belligerent state because it had failed to behave as a non-belligerent state. It had bases on its territory and had made its territory available for troops from countries at war with Germany. Whether this was done willingly or not is a different question, and of no particular importance. This neutral ship obeyed the current orders of the Admiralty, did not fulfill the condition that neutral ships should be illuminated at night, and even carried contraband. We found that the Zamzam was not carrying only missionaries, American orderlies and nurses. It had 10,000 barrels of oil, and 100 American trucks on board. The cargo was on its way to Cape Town and, judging by the markings, was intended for use by a country at war with Germany. In other words, the prize was well worth it, although Rog quickly realized the difficulties that would result from our action. They seemed insurmountable. An Egyptian ship was one thing, but American passengers were quite another, especially at a time when the United States administration was taking every opportunity to turn such situations 
to the advantage of its policy of supporting Great Britain. Shortly before the rendezvous with the Zam Zam, we had been receiving food from the Dresden, and now Rog had scheduled another rendezvous to complete the process. On the 18th, we transferred the passengers of the Zam Zam there, but all this was afterward, but for the present all the prisoners were with us, and I was to meet them face to face. It should be noted that some of them had very peculiar ideas about us. I heard one of them predict that we had brought them on board only to kill them and thus destroy the witnesses. I realized, of course, that we had not properly introduced ourselves. A wake-up call played by 5.9-inch guns is hardly the best way to start the day. Two American girls approached me. Their faces expressed an extreme degree of concern. Hmm, how good of you to speak English, said one. Please show me where there are oranges here. Oranges. They were as far away from us as sunny Spain. Where are their oranges? Sir, what are we going to do? The American women were frustrated. They were completely bewildered, obviously not understanding how one could exist without oranges. I didn't know that. As it turned out, the American girls had an unquenchable thirst for oranges, but I could not help them quench it. Unless you counted the booty from the Tirana, we hadn't tasted the juicy fruit ourselves for a year. I paced the deck filled with passengers and their personal belongings. Many of these people had been through unthinkable ordeals during the shelling of the liner. One mom put a life jacket on her little boy about six years old and dragged him behind her in the water. The boy, as it seemed to me, was not hurt. On the contrary, took everything that happened as a grand adventure. But his mother, as well as many other passengers, was in shock. The head of the American ambulance crew was one of the three critically wounded. He lay below in the ship's sick bay. A shell fragment had lacerated the hip of this handsome New Yorker, but his comrades had to force the Egyptians to take him into their lifeboat. Other prominent persons were also there, fortunately uninjured. These were Mr. J. W. Murphy, then one of the publishers of The Fortune, and Dr. D. A. Graf Hunter, the chief topographer of India. What have you been up to? I asked. Between the two armed sailors stood a somewhat confused and anxious passenger. He was taking pictures, said one of the sailors, and handed me a camera as proof. What is your name? I asked. Sherman. David Sherman. Who, who are you? He could have been a missionary, an orderly, or something else. The passenger smiled weakly. I'm a photographer. I shoot for life. David Sherman, of course. Life's photo reporter, being a not-so-skilled but diligent amateur, I was thrilled to see a talented professional at work. To the obvious displeasure of the sailors, the camera was ceremoniously returned to Sherman and we both began shooting the final scenes of the sinking of our mistaken victim. The Zam Zam went under quickly. It seemed to me that the vessel was glad to go to her eternal rest. At the rendezvous point with the Dresden we sailed to the accompaniment of hymns sung by the missionaries and our own Atlantic special, an old German folk song that had come to us from a sailing training ship formerly commanded by Rog. As we sang, our passengers remained silent and didn't seem to understand much of what we were talking about. One of them asked curiously, Could you tell me what the words of this song mean, and to the tune of which of the Nazi marches it was written? And I solemnly repeated the meaningless rhymes. Good evening, good night, offering roses, covered in carnations. Tomorrow morning, if the Lord wills, you'll wake up. The curious passenger listened to me very carefully and impatiently interrogated. Yes, I hear you, but what is meant here? Hmm, to be honest, I replied, I have no idea. It was only much later, after long reflection, 
that I thought I understood the meaning, which was surprisingly accurate to our circumstances. Neither of us had noticed it before. Drog, realizing the effect the Zamzam incident would have in shaping American public opinion, repeated his promise that the passengers would either be transferred en route to, to a neutral ship or be disembarked at a neutral port. He had already anticipated the press reaction to our latest victory, but we did not have to keep our promise. Three or four days after we parted company with the Dresden, a coded message was received from higher command, according to which, in violation of all previous instructions, the Dresden was ordered to proceed to occupied France. Roggy was very angry over this sudden change of policy, foreseeing that his promise and his point of view, as recorded by me in the ship's log, would be the cause of severe reprimand for both of us. Whatever one's views on the military aspect of the problem, and the risk of using a supply ship such as the Dresden to take prisoners to a neutral port, I am still convinced that it would have been far better if we had kept our original promise. And even the risk of losing the Dresden to internment or blockade could have been considered justified. Even disregarding the humanitarian dimension of the problem, the fulfilment of the promise was dictated by practicality. By breaking our word we incurred the contempt of all. We were therefore particularly anxious to learn of the fate of the Dresden and were relieved to learn of its safe arrival in occupied France. Rogete. Mercitariners rarely give themselves the trouble of figuring out what cargo an enemy vessel is carrying, and the mine that one is generally blind. The journey home was quite unpleasant for the passengers of the Zamzama. It lasted five weeks, during which time they lived under starvation, in unsanitary conditions, and were subjected to disciplinary rules, which were compulsorily severe, because we could only spare half a dozen sailors to reinforce the crew of the Dresden, and they had to control the vastly outnumbered prisoners. Before the Dresden left, I gave Sherman a note addressed to the naval authorities, asking just in case they changed their position as to a neutral port of destination to allow him to keep the photographs he had taken in my presence of the raider. They were perfectly innocuous. The naval authorities had a different opinion, and the photographs were confiscated. But other photographs that I did not know existed, dangerous images of the Atlantis that he had taken during the bombardment, Sherman managed to smuggle into America. One of them helped the captain of the Devonshire to identify us in our fateful encounter. When the Dresden disappeared from sight, everyone breathed a sigh of relief. Zamzam was clearly too much for us. The strain of having to provide for so many women and children and neutrals was too much. Piggers remarked approving. She Atlantis has never been so tidy or so quiet either. Strictly established order, he added, is only appreciated when you have to do without it for a while. Not to mention the eternal headache of feeding thirty-five little ones. But the epic with Zamzam was not over yet. Sighing with relief at the sight of the departing Dresden, we could not help but feel a sharp and very unpleasant odour. This terrible stench, I remarked, is getting stronger and stronger. It started out as a slight odour, but now it has turned into a nightmare. It's like it's coming from the fans. What the hell could it be? I wouldn't be surprised, Feeler predicted gloomily, that we'll all be dead soon. The stench had become a most pressing problem. It grew steadily worse and quickly became unbearable. For four days now, the detectives have been searching the ship. At first we thought that somehow dead rats had gotten into the ventilation shafts. We'd already found a rodent corpse in a mail sack once before. The dead rat realized late that the Esquire number was totally insufficient to keep it alive. We started searching, examined everything we could, but there was no result, and the stench kept getting worse. 
I don't remember who identified the true cause of the stench that spread throughout the ship. But eventually the trail led to a sack we had brought from the Zam's arm, containing maps, flags, compasses and so on, which had been left on the promenade deck to be dismantled later. Someone had stuffed three or four dozen frozen goose carcasses in there from the Zamzama's refrigerated trucks. The carcasses of nearly forty geese in various stages of decomposition lay at the intakes of our fans. Yuck! Soon the Zamzam episode became just a not-so-pleasant memory of the nervous tension and fears we had experienced on a moonlit night in the South Atlantic. It was our turn to learn what it feels like for game under the hunter's gun.